I'd like to see your most expensive stamp. It is perhaps the most famous of the extremely rare and valuable stamps out there. The inverted Jenny, featuring an upside down airplane, has been referenced numerous times on the big screen and the television screen. And they also attract media attention when one resurfaces or is found. When up for auction, they often fetch staggering price tags as collectors compete for one of the most desired stamps in the hobby. So what is so special about this stamp and why should we care? Let's explore the famous inverted Jenny in this episode of Hashtag Philately. The story of the inverted Jenny is so much more than just a stamp with a mistake on it. It is tied to the incredibly important and perhaps underappreciated achievement in world history, the introduction of airmail. There had been experimental airmail runs in the US from as early as 1911. That along with several different countries playing with the concept of airmail during the 1910s, it was just a matter of time until airmail became a major component of the transportation of civilian mail in the US. Side note, in 1912, a US parcel post stamp gets issued depicting these pioneering efforts to get mail in the air, although it's argued that it was more of a propaganda image to try rally political support for airmail. The stamp is titled Aeroplane Carrying Mail and it was worth 20 cents for parcel post. It is considered to be one of the first postage stamps to feature a plane. It wasn't until 1918 that the US Post Office Department began a scheduled airmail service between New York and Washington DC via Philadelphia. And so it's this 1918 airmail service that would require a special stamp. The start of this airmail service was to be a joint effort between the US Post Office Department and the US Army. This gave the Postal Department immediate access to experienced pilots while providing the US Army with additional training opportunities. The Army placed an order with the Curtis Aeroplane and Motor Company for planes to be used for airmail service of which consisted of several Curtis JN4 models. These biplanes were used during the First World War to train pilots and were ordered to be specially modified to carry mail in which the front seat now housed the mailbags. The planes were affectionately known as Jennies due to their assignment of JN4. On May 15th, 1918, hundreds of spectators gathered at Potomac Park to watch the first northbound airmail flight take place from Washington DC. President Wilson and the First Lady were both in attendance and many of the spectators were getting a glimpse of an airplane or one taking off for the very first time. 1918 was a bit of a strange year. The First World War was coming to an end, the 1918 flu pandemic was just getting started, automobiles were becoming a part of daily life and airplanes, a brand new invention, were just starting to become useful. Things were changing quickly. And so before noon on May 15th, 1918, the first northbound flight to New York took off and well, it, uh, it flew the wrong direction. The pilot went south instead of north and had to crash land on a farm in Maryland. The pilot was okay, but the mailbags had to be picked up by a postal truck and taken back to Washington to try it again the next day. Airmail was dangerous. The early days of flying put pilots in unpredictable weather, poor navigational and flying equipment, and with the lack of solid experience, it was extremely risky for pilots, in which over the next nine years saw frequent crashes and 34 airmail pilots killed. However, by pushing the boundaries of flight equipment, the distances traveled, the need to fly at night and establish flight paths as well as airport networks, airmail paved the way for commercial flying. Many of today's US commercial airlines are descendants of contracted airmail services from the 1920s. You could trace back their origin to airmail. Now, all of this was an occasion that required a stamp, and so a new airmail rate was authorized. The 24 cent stamp featuring the Curtis JN4 model is an exciting stamp. It was patriotic and meant to proudly display the colors of red, white, and blue during World War I. And while there is no mention of airmail on the stamp, it was symbolized with the image of the Curtis JN4. But there are a couple of interesting things to note about the image. Firstly, it displays an unmodified version of the Jenny, one that wasn't made to carry airmail. You can tell by the presence of the first seat. 
This had been closed up and turned into a storage place where the mail was housed for the actual planes that carried the airmail. The second thing to note is the serial number on the plane, 38262. And this is considered to be a bit of a mystery because it is the exact same number of the first plane to leave from Washington carrying airmail. So it's accurate. But the mystery is that the Bureau of Engraving and Printing didn't know which plane was to take off that day. And they'd received a list of numbers of potential planes in the final moments before printing the stamps. But the actual plane wasn't selected until after those stamps were printed. It's likely to just be a coincidence, but it's a happy coincidence. The stamp's serial number matches the plane serial number that took off from Potomac Park. Another interesting feature is that the stamp was 24 cents. Quite a significant increase from the regular postage that was 3 cents at the time. And that rate only lasted for two months. The rate was lowered to 16 cents in July and then again lowered to 6 cents in December. Each time the stamp was modified and reprinted, but this time in one color. The 16 cents was in green, while the 6 cents was orange. But during the two months of being current, over 2.1 million 24 cent airmail stamps were sold, some being used, while others being stored in stamp collectors' albums. So what about the famous error? Well, the stamps were printed in a two-part process to get the two different colors. First, the sheets were printed with the red frames, and then the printing plate was prepared with the blue planes that were then printed within the red frames. This of course opens the door for errors because the alignment needs to be precise. And you can see this with the several variations of the Jenny stamp that are out there. There is the fast plane, the slow plane, the high flying plane, the landing plane, and the grounded plane. All examples of where precision was just a little bit off. These stamps were printed in a hurry. The engravers were working on the stamp just a week prior to their issue date, May 14th, the day before the first airmail flight. Now, a gentleman by the name of William T. Roby, an avid stamp collector, was hoping to find an inverted error. He believed one would exist with the issuing of these stamps. Either the sheet of red frames would be inserted upside down, or the plate would be placed accidentally upside down. Either way, he was in shock to actually find an inverted sheet after a second visit to a New York Avenue branch post office in Washington DC that day. He was looking for them, and he found them. He simply asked the postal clerk to show him the latest sheets that had been dropped off at the post office that day. He quickly noticed the 100 sheet of inverts and discreetly paid for them before showing the postal clerk the inverts that he did not notice. The postal clerk, realizing what just happened, ran to the phone and Roby walked out the post office. The story of the inverted Jenny had just begun. Shortly after purchasing, Roby was visited by postal inspectors who tried to intimidate him into giving the stamps back. But Roby was witty and a pretty smart stamp collector that managed to keep calm and brush them aside. He knew that he had to sell them quickly, and so he started to reach out to dealers all over and let them know about the invert and that it was available for sale. This must have been stressful. Apart from avoiding the bureau inspectors that were trying to intimidate him into giving the stamps back, he had to find somebody to sell it to and for a worthy price. The longer he held onto the stamps, the more likely someone else was to find another sheet of inverts. And so each time somebody finds a sheet of inverts, his 100 stamps become less and less rare and ultimately less and less valuable. After hearing about the inverted stamps, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing Inspectors went through their stock and found eight unsold sheets of inverted jennies, which they then destroyed. Roby had the only sheet of 100 inverts, and he was able to sell them to a stamp dealer in Philadelphia for $15,000, which is a tremendous profit from the $24 he originally paid. Collectors refer to the stamp as the inverted jenny because the jenny, the plane, is indeed inverted relative to the red frame. And invert errors in philately are exactly that. Something is accidentally upside down in relation to something else. It could be the frame, images, colors, watermarks, or overprints could all be invert errors. Now, apparently the plane itself, the Jenny, couldn't fly upside down. Aerobatics was being performed at that time by stunt pilots in other planes, but the Jenny was restricted by its engine power and by the curvature of its wings. So it couldn't do more than a loop or a roll. And it certainly couldn't fly, you know, inverted. 
inverted. How did Tom Cruise demonstrate that? Well, if you were directly above him, how could you see him? Because I was inverted. 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 Because I was inverted. Inverted. Now, going back to the name of the stamp, you'll also hear of it being referred to as number C3A. Anyone see you? I would guess so. What are we doing there? I had just acquired the inverted Jenny, number C3A. The airplane, upside down. This is the number that the Scott catalogs assigned it. C referred to this new class of mail, airmail. Considering that three airmail stamps were issued in 1918, they numbered them in order of denomination and not issue date. So orange six cents was one, green was two, and the bicolor was three. And this being a variant of the stamp, the inverted Jenny, it was assigned the letter A to call it out. So it's referred to as C3A. After Roby sold the sheet, each stamp was assigned a number based on its position within the sheet, and that number was written in pencil on the back. The sheet was then broken up into singles and blocks of four and eight, and so the 100 inverted jennies began a fascinating tour of changing hands and belonging to interesting collectors over the years. Some were stolen and retrieved, some were deliberately mutilated by tampering with the perforations to disguise them as different positions on the sheet. One was accidentally sucked up by a vacuum cleaner, but it survived. The sale price for some of these stamps have reached staggering amounts of money. One fascinating aspect of the inverted jennies that needs to be known is the Ethel McCoy block, a block of four jennies that were purchased for Ethel by her dying husband. They were stolen during a stamp convention in 1955. Since then, three have been found, of which were only retrieved after Ethel's death in 1980, one as late as 2016. Before she died, she named the American Philatelic Research Library as the beneficiary for the missing stamps for when they are found and recovered. As of today, the research library has retained one of those stamps and is the current owner, but one of the stamps is still missing. It's still out there. Number 66. This is an FBI case that is still ongoing, and it's known that the stamps were sold after being stolen. And while the APRL, the American Philatelic Research Library, is the rightful owner of the missing stamp, there have been awards offered in the past for the return of the stamp with no questions asked. So um, if Granny and Grandpa have been acting suspicious whenever you go near their stamp collection, perhaps it's time to confront them. The stamp is iconic. It's shown up in television and cinema in which it stars as the prized jewel that is both valuable and rare. And it has also been issued by the USPS as a commemorative stamp in 2013. The USPS issued mini sheets of the inverted Jenny stamps at a face value of $2 to celebrate this famous stamp era. But what the USPS deliberately did with the issuing of those stamps was print 100 of the sheets the right side up. Lucky winners of the right side up stamps ended up with a valuable item that has reached tens of thousands of dollars on the market. So why should we care? This is the question that I asked at the beginning of the video. Well, to me, the stamp is interesting because of its origin, its story, and its connection to the evolution of how we communicate. But it's also interesting because the story is not yet over. It's ongoing. As a collector or a stamp enthusiast, you could and should follow the story as it continues to be written. There are only 100 inverted jennies, and the sale and auction of them is not infrequent. They happen occasionally. Actually, at the time of filming, there is one stamp available for purchase on the Mystic Stamp website. Position 27. It's going for over half a million dollars, but um, that shipping rate? Almost three dollars? Yeah, that's, uh, that's pushing it a bit far for me, so... Uh, no thanks. Several of the inverted jennies disappear from public view for decades before re-emerging in an auction. Each stamp is known by its position on the sheet, so each stamp is tied to a rich history of owners and unique stories. And while you might not be able to own one of the 100 inverted jenny stamps right now, the regular non-inverted jennies are affordable in mint or used condition. There are covers available, but they are quite a bit more expensive. There are two resources that I'd like to point you to. The first is invertedjenny.com. This site not only has loads of more detail about the history of the stamp, its production, the early history of airmail, and so on, 
but it is keeping a current listing of each of the stamps from the sheet of 100. This includes a recent scan if available and who has owned or currently owns the stamp. Several of the stamps get bought on auction anonymously, then we don't see them for a while. Others that we may know the owner of make the news from time to time. Another great resource is this book called Stamp of the Century. It's written by Kellen Diamanti and Deborah Fisher. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this book as it details the story of the inverted Jenny, its origin and its owners. I'm going to include those details and links in the description of this video as well as additional information that you can explore about the inverted Jenny. As always, thank you for watching and happy exploring.